but yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you, you may be seated. Now, to, to you guys, you're looking like what's happening. But to my members, this is a regular thing for them. This is a weekly thing. So, so you guys get to be a part of our conversation today. And so I'm going to go ahead and pray, and let me give explanation because, again, as you're visiting, you're probably wondering what's happening. When I first started preaching, but actually before, the Lord introduced me to what is known as the talit, the prayer shawl. And he said, every single time you go to preach, I need you to wrap yourself in this because this is representative of me. It allows you to know that I am with you and I am covering you. And so, being covered with his spirit and with his presence, I'm going to pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to be in your house this morning. Father, we are asking that your presence will remain with us. We know that you're already here, but we're asking that you would just linger a little bit longer. Father, you know the words that you have crafted for the audience. There are your words. I am but your servant delivering the mail. And so, God, I ask that as they receive it, that their hearts may be gladdened by what they hear, disturbed if they need to be disturbed. But, God, that it may drive us all to repentance and to ask that we, what can we do to be saved. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let me ask a question. Are there any Marvel fans in the house? Yeah. Come on, come on, come on. Are there any Marvel fans in the house? Iron Man. Yeah. We got some Iron Man. I see some hands. We got some, we got some, who else? Some Hulk fans, some Spider-Man. So, nope, nobody, y'all don't know about that, right? Okay, y'all, y'all must, be, they must be DC fans. This is a Marvel house, everybody. Because we Marvel, because Jesus, it makes us Marvel. So we have the Marvel house. One of my favorite characters, out of all of the Marvel characters, out of the Avengers, man, I love Thor. I love Thor. Now you see I have my you see I have my my Captain America shield there. But nothing does it like Thor. Do you know there's a movie in the Thor series when it when it first came out that 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 Thor had just gone to fight. He's trying to defend Asgard. And in so fighting he defies Odin. He comes back because they've had gotten a whipping. They've gotten beat. And and Odin pulls Thor to the side and he says, you know what? You're arrogant, you're, you're, you're vain, you're a cruel boy. Do you understand that you put us in jeopardy? Thor has an attitude. He smacks back, he talks back to his father. And the father, being a good father, says, you know what, Thor, you're banished. You're banished until you can learn the lesson. And he picks up Thor's hammer. You see it, you hear it? And he strips Thor of all of his authority. And he says these words to the hammer, to Mjolnir. Again, we got some Marvel fans in the house, you know what I'm talking about. I saw, I saw a smile back there, he's like, yes, I know that hammer. He says the words to, ham, to Mjolnir. He says, whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, let him possess the power of Thor. I would like to take you into the Bible. We're gonna look at a familiar story that you probably have missed some things on. Since we are about school, I would like somebody to spell for me the word hid. Like I hid it under a blanket, I hid it under the bushel. How do we spell hid, everybody? H-I-D, three points. We're dealing with three points today. H-I-D, we're looking at the story and the life of Joseph. We know it, yes? Or we think we know it. When we look at the story of Joseph, it tells us we are introduced to Joseph in Genesis chapter 37. 
it tells us, now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of, jo of Jacob. But then it says, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and, a lad, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. It says, now Israel loved Joseph more than all the children because he was the son of his old age. And then when we step down to, jump down to verse 5, it says, now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. He hated, they hated him even more. I want to give you guys a side of Joseph, the side that we don't really talk about. We know Joseph is the great dreamer. But before Joseph became the great dreamer that we would come to know as the one second in command in Egypt, Joseph was a 17-year-old, spoiled, brat, tattletale child. The favorite of his father. You read it in, right there in the text. Joseph knew his position as far as the other brothers were concerned. And Joseph had this knack that he would kind of play to his favoritism. We read right here that Joseph gives a bad report. Now, how many of you guys have siblings? Now, if your brothers and sisters are doing something bad, are you the one that's going to tattle and tell on your brothers or siblings? What happens if you are the tattletale on the brothers and sisters? They, they get you. And when you look at the text, this is exactly what is going on. It tells us that Joseph, the tattletale, the spoiled kid of his, favorite, of his father, being the favorite child, he goes and he gives this bad report on his brothers. And not only does he do that, Joseph has this, this knack, this dream, this, this gift. But Joseph did not know at this point how to manage the gift. As a matter of fact, the text tells us that Joseph, knowing the position of his brothers, you would think if he knew that they hated him, he would have been careful how he brought the message. But look what it says in verse 5. It says that Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him. So he said to them, please hear the dream that I have dreamed. Here it is, the 17-year-old Joseph, knowing his position in the family, knowing that he is the favorite of his father, would go to the brothers that he knew, also knew hated him and kind of almost rub it in, rubbing it in. And so the first lesson we're talking about hit. And so here it is, the first lesson, the H, the lesson that Joseph will learn is the lesson of humility. The lesson of humility. How does God, God wants to take him someplace, but he goes, Joseph, you're not ready yet. And so I got to do you like, like, like Odin did Thor. I have to take you through some things in order to teach you how to be a leader, how to really take the gift that I've put in you so that it could be used for my glory. And so Joseph finds himself in a situation. He's told to go and talk to, go find out what his brothers are doing. And while he's there, verse 21, 23, it says, so it came to pass when Joseph, he's there, he's visiting his brothers, and they say, well, let's see what will come of this dreamer. And it tells us that Joseph is stripped of this beautiful coat that his father had given him. The coat of many colors. The coat that would set him apart from the other brothers. The coat that would say that you are better than them. This coat, this coat that would eventually talk about what his destiny would become is now also the coat that becomes stripped from him. Stripped because he has some lessons to learn about what it is to be a leader. But I love the story because it tells us that although he stripped of this coat, it says in verse 23, came to pass that when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic and that they, they put him in a pit, 24, and they cast him and it was empty and there was no water in there. But you know what life is? When God is trying to teach you lessons, when it's talking about trying to humble you, because sometimes we might think ourselves better than what we are. And God has to take us down a peg or two. But when we look at the text, Joseph is finding himself not just in a pit, but now he's going to find himself in Potiphar's house. The Bible tells us a couple of things, that Joseph had a good attitude, even though he was being, even though he was being taught how to be a leader. This is life. Joseph didn't let it get him down. See, because the thing is this, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. 
They take a punch and they keep going. So Joseph finds himself in this situation. He's now in chapter 39. He's a slave. But verse 2 says, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And we'll read a little bit further. It says in verse 3, and the, math, and the master saw that the Lord was with him. So the first lesson Joseph had to learn was the lesson of humility. Now watch what he said when he talked about his dream. Joseph said, I have had a dream. Well, now we're going to see what the next lesson is. We said the H is for what? Humility. And we're spelling word. Now we're talking about the I. Joseph finds himself. He's now the slave in Potiphar's house. And if you don't know the story, I'm going to give it to you real quick. The Potiphar has a wife, and Potiphar's wife has longing eyes for Joseph. And Joseph is a 17-year-old body, a 17-year-old boy who's probably been working really hard, and 17-year-old is looking good to this older woman. I know. There's no cougars in the house. And so she comes to him day after day after day after day and trying to get Joseph to do things that good Israelite boys shouldn't do, that good any boy shouldn't do. And so Joseph comes and he finds himself being faced with this time after time after time. And he tells her, look, if we're looking, verse 8 of chapter 39, but he refused and he said to his master's wife, look. My master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that, is, all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in the house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The second test that Joseph is going to have after the test of humility and being brought down, he's going to have the test of integrity. See, because let me tell you what character is. Character is not what, it, what, what you look like when people are watching. Character is what you look like when nobody's watching. And so we find Joseph here in a situation where it could have just, just between, between Potiphar's wife and Joseph and it could have been kept a secret. But this is really bigger than this moment. And why is it bigger than this moment? Because God is trying to take Joseph somewhere. Think about this in terms of character. If Joseph had messed up here, could Joseph have been trusted later? If Joseph was going to be taken to be the second in command, how do we know that Joseph would not begin to line his pockets with the gold of Egypt if no one was watching? This lesson, the lesson, is the lesson of integrity. But Potiphar's wife is not happy with what Joseph's response is, and so she has him cast into prison. Joseph, the 17-year-old, going down from where he was now in Egypt, in a foreign land, he takes another hit. But as we said, the weebles wobble. Ah, this one is kind of on the side. We got to help them out. <laughs> but they don't fall down. <laughs> See, sometimes you need somebody to help you out. <laughs> so Joseph has found himself now in the pit. And I need you to understand, as we're looking at this, he finds himself in Potiphar's house, and, and he's now been put in prison. And while he's in prison, there are some guys, and they've had these dreams. And as they're telling the dreams, Joseph wakes up one morning, and he sees the faces of the baker and, and the, and, and the, and the cupbearer, and they're looking sad. And Joseph, if you come with me, because we're taking it fast, because I don't want to keep you here long. We're now in, in, in Genesis chapter 40. Are you there with me? Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. I want you to see what happens now. Remember, this is about the integrity. Verse, verse 8. And so they said to him, we, have, we each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to who? Joseph should have stopped there. But if you look, Joseph did not stop there. Because God is still trying to work with Joseph. But look what Joseph says. Does not interpretation belong to God? Tell them to me. God had given Joseph the gift of dreams, but there was something about Joseph that he had, that, that Joseph had this bit of something in him that he thought it was he and God. Joseph put a lot of stock in what he could do. And so when you look at the text, Joseph is sharing sharing the glory with God. But when we talk about God's glory, who, who gets all the glory? God 
God and God alone. And at this point, Joseph is not ready. And so we find that Joseph says to the guy, he says, look, when you get out of this prison, I need you to go and tell Pharaoh that I helped you with the dream. Remember me. But there's a problem with that. Because Joseph was still looking to self to solve the issue. St Joseph still not quite yet learned the piece of humility, although he had been there a while. He was now in this place of, I need to, to take myself out of the picture, but he hasn't done it yet. And the Bible tells us that he's there a little bit longer. As a matter of fact, let's see what it says in chapter 41. Then it came to pass at the end of how many years? Chapter 41, verse 1. We're going fast because I want you to get out of here. At the end of how many years? Two full years. So maybe Joseph has gotten the message now. Maybe Joseph has learned the lesson now. Let's discover it and find out. Now the first problem, the first lesson that Joseph was learning was the lesson of what? Now the second lesson that Joseph was learning was the lesson of what? And now here we are at the third lesson. The lesson of dependency. We look, it's been two years that Joseph has been locked up in this prison. He has been getting it left and right. The Bible tells us that God was with him. And because God was with him, he was able to take some punches. He was able to stay there, even though he didn't want to be there. This is what life is doing to Joseph. But Joseph is able to bounce back. Because weebles wobbles, but they don't fall down. So here it is. Pharaoh gets the dream. There's no one who can interpret the dream for Pharaoh. He's calling all the divine people. He goes, tell me what the dream is. But nobody can tell him what the meaning of the dream is. And then... And then the cupbearer goes, I remember there was a guy in prison. And he told me my dream. When, when you sent me here, he reminded me. I'm, I'm now just now remembering what, what happened. That I'm here because this guy told me the dreams. And so the Pharaoh calls for Joseph to be brought. I want you to know that the first jacket, that the first coat that Joseph had on was stripped of him, that coat of many colors, because he wasn't quite ready for it yet. And then he finds himself having another coat, another garment taken from him. Because he's learning, God is teaching him something of how to be resilient. And now we find him about to be placed with a third coat. But watch what happens. Joseph, in, in verse 14 of chapter 41, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, changing his clothes. He put off what was holding him down. And he came to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream. But there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said that you can understand a dream to interpret it. Look at verse 16. I want us to do a comparison of what Joseph said when he was in prison and what he says now. I want us to do a comparison of what Joseph said when he first started having dreams and what he says now. Because if you remember, when he first started having dreams, he was like, I have had a dream. Right? You all with me? Is that what he said? When he talked to his brothers, is that what he said? He said, I had a dream. He was putting it all on him like he was the man. And then while he finds himself in prison, he goes from, hey, God has the power to interpret dreams, but why don't you tell me what the dream is? Still putting himself on equal ground with God. But let's see what Joseph does now. It says in verse 16, so Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh the answer of peace. The third lesson that Joseph learns is the lesson of dependency, complete dependency on God. At this point, Joseph has learned that it is God and God alone, that he doesn't get to share credit with God. So I want you to know that there are some gifts that have been given to you, but God gave you a gift. It is not for you. It is for his glory. And so I need you to understand that when life comes, because life is going to come, life is going to knock you around, life is going to do this to you. But I need you to remember this. They're weebles, wobbles, but they what? Don't fall down. Uh, I'm going to ask it. Weebles, wobbles, but they what? Don't fall down. I want you to, I don't know who is in this audience today. I don't know who is taking a hit. I don't know who is getting beat up by the enemy. But you know what? You might, let's see what he's going to get up. He's going to need somebody to help him get up. But praise God that God is the one that's going to help us get out. He will not allow us to be beat up by the enemy for too long. He has equipped us with something. He's given us a weight that when we get pushed around, when we get knocked around, there's something that holds us down. It anchors us. It is anchoring us in Jesus Christ. We must make sure that our calling and election is sure it is in Christ and in Christ alone. We don't get to share credit with God. You know, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. 
But you know how they don't fall down? They don't fall down because they are anchored in Jesus. Now, if you are not anchored in Jesus, you might find yourself falling down. And let's see, this is what happens if you anchor. If you're not anchored, you might find yourself like this. But the Christian, praise God. Look at this. He wants to make me a liar today. Now you want to play with me, Bozo. Bozo wants to play with me today. Look, Bozo. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. They might get knocked down, but praise God. Let's see. Now he's going to go on this side and decide to stay down. But that's when he sends a help. We need to understand. When we look at Joseph's life, it is after Joseph learns the lesson that it is not him and God, but it is just God that Joseph now gets restored to power. Just like when we looked at the story of Thor, it was after Thor made the sacrifice, learning that it was never about him. But it was supposed to be the sacrifice made for humanity. It was then that Thor is restored, restored to the power. Jesus wants to restore some of us today. Yes. It's not about us. It's never been about us. It's always been about Jesus. Jesus is asking this question. Has life been beating you up? Has life been knocking you down? Has life been tossing you back and forth? and you have not had someone to aid you to be able to stand, if that is the case, today the opportunity has been given to you to lean and trust in Jesus. He's the only one who's gonna be able to help you through storms. He's the only one who's gonna be able to bring you up when Satan comes against you to knock you down, when circumstances come against you to knock you over. There's only one anchor, and the anchor is Jesus Christ alone. We need to learn the lesson. Hid. Hid. We need to learn the final part of the lesson that Joseph learned. How to depend on God. How many of you guys depend on God? How many of you guys, just by show of hands, you put it down, I want to know. Has this happened to anybody this week? Anybody got hit this week? If, if you got hit something unexpected this week, raise your hand. If, if Satan has been doing this to you for the past couple of weeks, raise your hand. Stand. If Satan has been, been abusing you and knocking you over, please stand to your feet. If there's been situations that have come and you go, I don't know how I'm going to get through it. I don't know what I'm going to do. It's knocking me back and forth. I'm losing it and I don't see my way out of this. If this has been Satan doing this to you for the past couple of weeks, I need you to know that you are waiting in Jesus. And he has no victory. That Satan is a defeated foe. Satan is a defeated foe. Whatever that thing is that he's been knocking you over with, there's someone that comes and gives you aid. Lord, you see your people. Some of them have been taking hits left and right from the enemy this week. But God, we thank you that there is the text that tells us that we are crushed, but we're not despair. God, weebles wobble, but they don't stay down. They might get knocked down for a second, but they don't stay down. And praise your holy name, God, that when we find ourselves when we cannot get up, you send aid. You send aid by your spirit. You send aid by other Christians that help us get back up on our feet again. Oh, what a wonderful, loving father that you are. Now, God, I ask for the people who are standing, the ones who said they've been taking a hit left and right, getting black eyes and bloody noses from the enemy. God, would you go and fight their battles? Would you go and beat back the enemy and do not give him any more ground to have sway in their lives? God, I'm asking this week you turn it around. God, I'm asking that you do something so crazy, so miraculous, that they would call in this moment when they stood, they stood for Jesus. And because they stood for Jesus, you will also stand for them. Father, fight on their behalf. God, we thank you for how you love us. We thank you that you never leave us alone. And you give us and equip us, the, give us the ability to be able to stand firmly on the anchor, our rock, Christ Jesus. It's in his name, God, I ask that you would bless these individuals as they go on their way. In Jesus' name.